Hey everybody, thanks for joining. Uh, today we're talking about how to build and, and also consume web services from your, uh, your Windows Phone apps and games. So we'll go ahead and get started on that. Uh, before we dive into the code, got a little bit of basics to cover real quick for those of you not familiar with, with how web services work or, or what they do. Uh, essentially, this is functionality that's part of .NET and, and other systems as well that allow you to build methods that exist on a server not necessarily local to you. And so you use them just as if they were part of your local solution or project, but they can actually sit on a server either in your office or down the hall or, or on the other side of the world. And what happens is, is when you set a reference to these services in your project, it's going to pull down some information about these services and what methods they expose, and it's going to create some proxies in your project that you can then hit as if they were local to your project. And so we're going to go ahead and, and jump right into those. Um, well, actually, before we jump right into those, my apologies, uh, I want to talk real quick about some, some possible uses for this sort of thing. So when you're, when you're building Windows Phone apps or games, um, I tend to build a lot of games, so we'll use some examples from there. Let's say you've got a, a game that you want to have a, a global high scoreboard for, for example. So you, maybe you have 2,000 people have downloaded your game, and you want to store all the high scores in one spot instead of having a different set of high scores on every phone. And so you could use WCF services to send high score information up to this high score board that you store perhaps in the cloud you know, using Azure or maybe you just store it on a web server on the internet. And so anytime new high scores get posted, it would go up to this global high score board. And then you could also maintain local scores if you wanted to. Or another example is matchmaking between gamers. Maybe you've got a, a turn-based game, maybe something like a board game like Scrabble or something like that, where you have the game and then within that game you could potentially have multiple matches with different players. So Maybe I have six people on my friends list and I, I have ongoing games with three of them at any given point. And so you could actually build out a service that would enable you to request a new match with someone on your friends list or possibly even request a, a random match with anybody else that's, that's running that game. And so they could post their request for a match on the service and then the next time somebody else posted a request for a match, the service would take care of linking those two players up together and, and pushing down some simple game state to them. Um, speaking of game state, that's another great way to use services is maybe you want to store some stuff locally in, in isolated storage, but you also want to push some game state info up to the cloud. Uh, you can certainly do that with, with web services. And then, of course, interacting with the push notification service, which we covered in, a, in an earlier talk. Um, this gives you the ability to, maybe you've got a game where you're not necessarily playing head-to-head -head at the same time, but you have a friends list of people who are playing the same game as you, and maybe something happens in their game that they want to push a notification to people on their friends list. So you would use a web service to push the information up and then store it locally, or not locally, excuse me, store it on the server and then you can take that information depending on the nature of the of the notification and push it across Microsoft's push notification service down to the other phones of the people on your friend list, for example. So without any further talk about that, we'll go ahead and, and dive into the code. So let me flip over to Visual Studio. So the first thing we're going to do is this solution is actually going to have two projects. So the first one is going to be the WCF service, and so we're going to create that, and then we'll create an XNA game that uses that WCF service to, to push some information back and forth and, and display it in, in the game. So we'll start off by creating our new WCF project. We're going to call it Serve You, and our XNA game will be cleverly called Serve Me. If you are using Visual Studio Ultimate, then you're going to want to go under the Visual Studio templates in WCF, pick the WCF service application, which is highlighted here. We gave it a name of ServeView and our solution, we're just calling it the services demo. So I'll go ahead and create that. Now, in here, but automatically, you're going to get a couple of 
web methods and you're going to get a service that's already built out and functional. So before we dive into the code, let's go ahead and start the service that you get automatically because this will give me an opportunity to show you something called the WCF test client, which is pretty cool because what that does is that allows you to actually test your services in Visual Studio. And one thing about services is that they don't have a UI of their own. So if you want to test them, you either need to write code against them to test the methods that they expose, or you can use the WCF test client to examine the service and see what methods are getting exposed, and then you can try those methods out by passing in data to them. So in this case, we've got our service here, and this is the one that we get for free just by creating a WCF project. And it's got two methods, get data and get data using data contract. So if we take a look at get data, double click it, we're going to see the request up here on the top and the response down here on the bottom. And so in this case, we're going to pass in an integer, which you can see here. So let's change this 0 to a 6. And then we invoke the service. So we're passing in an integer with a value of 6. And after a second or two, we're getting back a string that says you entered 6. Okay, pretty straightforward. Let's go ahead and close that and then take a look at the, the get data service. So here you can see get data accepts an integer called value and then we're returning a string with that value as part of the text. And So it's a, a very, very basic example. Now we're going to take this and we're going to gut most of this in order to make our own service. So the first, oh, before I gut it though, there's one other thing I wanted to show you. And so along with our service1.svc for service.cs file, we also have an interface file. So we pop that open. And this is where we define, um, we, we put the service contract of our service up here and, and any methods that we're going to expose. So we, we put operation contract on each of those. And here's our get data method that we're going to implement. And then here's the other one, get data using data contract. And of course, the, the data type that it's expecting. And so we're actually going to change the interface as well as the service, because we have to change both. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So the first thing we're going to do, let's go ahead and clean this one up a bit. And I'm going to copy some code in here. I'll go ahead and just gut this one completely. And paste in the new one. The new one's a lot smaller, as you can see. So here we've got our, our namespaces that we're going to be using. We've got our service contract attribute, our operation contract attribute, and then the one method that we're creating called current time save that and then we're going to do the same thing for our service. So we'll go ahead and carve all that out and we're going to paste in the code for the service and it's going to be equally brief because there's just not a whole lot going on here. So again we've got a couple of namespaces. Oops, that should be just serve you. Uh, we've got our class service one. Uh, we're implementing the iService1 interface. Uh, we've got our current time method and our method actually basically just takes the current time from whatever server our service is running on, converts it to a string, and then returns it to whatever called it. So at this point, if we go ahead and run this. We're going to see our WCF test client again. And right here you can see we've got the current time method that we just created. If I double click on that, in this point, it doesn't actually ask for an, a variable or a parameter going in. It's just going to return something. So there's, there's nothing up here to type into. So we just hit invoke, and it's going to get the current date and time and return that as a string. So pretty straightforward. It's a little simple, understood, but it'll allow us to have something nice and easy to use in our XNA project. So go ahead and close this. And we're going to create, oh, actually, my mistake, before I close that, I need to grab the, um, the, U, the URI of 
of my service so that I can create a reference to it. So we're going to copy the address from the test client. It's right here. This is the address of the service that we created. Now I can close that. We're going to create an XNA project and we can just make it in the same solution. Not a problem. So go up here. We're going to add a new project. And this time it's going to be XNA instead of WCF. So we'll go down here, hit XNA. It's going to be a Windows Phone game. And we're just going to call it Serve Me. Hit OK. All right, once we've got our project here, we're going to create a servant, excuse me, a service reference to the WCF service we've already created. So here's our Serve Me project, which we'll go ahead and do a couple things. We're going to set that as our startup project. We don't want to start the service. And then under references, we're going to add a service reference. And we're going to discover. We're going to find, hey, this is the one we just created. It's already in our solution. If it was in a different solution or maybe just out on the web somewhere, that's when you would want that, that URL that we copied. And you'd paste that up here. And then it would go fetch it and pull back information about it. But since it's already in our local solution, we don't need to do that. So I can expand this. That will take a second or two. And so we've got our service. And then in the interface, you can see we have current time, which is the method we created. So we go ahead and hit OK. And that's not only going to add a service reference, it's also going to add a few more namespaces to the references section. So one of the things we want to check to make sure it's actually here is we're looking for system.net, um, system.runtime serialization, so here's .net, runtime serialization, and system.service model. So we're going to need those. Unfortunately, it adds those in for you automatically. So now in our code, we're going to clean this up a little bit. The stuff that's grayed out means those are namespaces that we're not actually taking advantage of in this project. So I'll get rid of those, just clean it up a little bit. And we're going to add a using statement that points to serve me dot service reference one. So what happens is, is when we set that service reference, it adds it to our serve me project, and then we can reference that, and then utilize whatever methods are exposed by that as if they were local to our project, or, or just like anything else in the .NET framework, really. So once we've done that, um, those of you that are familiar with XNA, we need to add a few class level variables to let us do stuff like write on the screen and stuff like that. So in our game class here, scroll up a little, right after the sprite batch, I'm going to add a sprite font. And for those of you not familiar with XNA, a sprite font gives you the ability to draw text on screen. So we'll go ahead and add that. And we do talk about XNA basics in some of the earlier webinars in this series. The, the first and second webinars focus mostly on XNA, so you can get a lot of the, the basic stuff from those if you want to check those out. And those are available on the Dev Express website. So we've got our sprite font. We also need something to hold our client from our service. So we'll call this service one client. You notice right now they're grayed out because we haven't done anything with them yet. Now we have a string called current time. Alright, we're going to use a double tap gesture to actually trigger the service call. So we need to set the enable gestures property for the touch panel. We're going to do that in our initialize method here. Oops, I need to do that above there. It doesn't really matter a whole lot, but it's, it's better form. Alright, it seems to be complaining a little bit about touch panel. Must have oh, I did. Let's go ahead and add one of those namespaces back in that I just deleted. 
that's my fault. Input dot touch. So that's the problem with uh, premature optimization is sometimes you take out stuff that you don't think you need only to realize, oh, I'll need it at some point. So should have left that one in. So here we have the, ena the enable gestures property of our touch panel basically says, I'm going to be using these gestures in my game. And in this case, the only thing we're using is double tap. But this is where you would put stuff like tap, double tap, pinch, um, drag vertical, drag horizontal, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and so you only need to enable whatever you're going to use. And, and that tells XNA to keep an eye out for this gesture while my app or game is running. Okay, next in the load content method, we need to load up a sprite font. Uh, before we do that, we need to actually add a sprite font. So if I go over here to our Solution Explorer, let me collapse some of this. It's a little more readable. In addition to Serve You, which is our WCF project, and Serve Me, which is our XNA game project, we also have Serve Me Content, which is a content project that is created when the XNA project gets created. And so we're going to add a sprite font to our content project, so new item, sprite font, and we'll just keep that name, hit add, and as I mentioned, the sprite font allows you to draw on screen. And the way it does that is it is an XML file that you specify what font that already exists on your system you want to use, along with what size you want to use it, and it's going to, at build time, it's going to read that font, let's make our lettering kind of big, it's going to read that font and it's going to create a sprite sheet, which is basically like a large graphic, full of all the letters and numbers in that font at the size right here that we specify. And then at runtime, it's going to take that sheet, and if you tell, if you do a, a draw string command to the screen to write the words hello world, for example, it's going to grab all the individual letters of your string from that huge image and piece them together and draw it on screen. So unfortunately, you can't cut and paste or copy and paste on the phone in an XNA app because you're not really dealing with text. You're actually dealing, dealing with a graphical representation of text. And also, every sprite font exists only at the size you create it. So if this one's at 22 point, if I needed another one at 10 point, I wouldn't resize it programmatically. I would actually create a second sprite font at the correct size and then use that one when I need the smaller text. So let's go ahead and close our sprite font. And then in the load content, uh, right after our sprite batch, actually right after our to do comment, we're going <clears> to <throat> load the sprite font in. We've already set up the variable for it. So sprite font equals content.load. And we're going to tell it that we're loading a sprite font. So that's a generic method. And then we're going to give it the name of our sprite font that was actually created for the content project, and we'll close that off. Excellent. So this is going to load it up. It's going to load up that giant graphic when we hit the load content method of our XNA game, and then drawstring will slice it up as needed. In addition to our sprite font, we need to instantiate our service client. So we'll do that. And then we're going to set up a, uh, an event handler. One of the things to understand about XNA, if you're not familiar with it, is that it doesn't use the traditional event-driven model like, say, Windows Forms or Web Forms. Go ahead and grab this. But it does support event handlers. So if there are certain cases where maybe you've got data coming in from a service or you've got data coming in from the GPS or a push notification, or you want to set up event handlers. Everything else actually just occurs in your game loop, in your update and draw methods. But, but in this case, we need an event handler. So we'll go ahead and set that up. And so we've got our event handler here. Um, it's expecting current time completed event args. And it's going to call the service one client current time completed method, which we haven't created yet. So now we need to go ahead and add that method. So we'll get out of the load content method. We'll just go down here near the bottom of the class where I like to add additional stuff that's not already put in there for you. 
<clears throat> Just so you don't watch me type poorly for the next couple minutes, I'm going to paste this one in and then we'll talk about it. So here, this is the method that's getting called by our event handler. And all we're doing is we're taking that current time um, variable that we defined up at the top of the class and we're taking whatever gets passed in from our service call and we're converting that to a string and then putting it in that variable. And so when we call our method, we're going to get the, the date and the time. It's going to pass it back. This event here is going to fire. This event here is going to fire. And it's going to take whatever we get back from the service, convert it to string, stick it in current time. <clears throat> this way, your, your game loop gets to just keep looping. You're not sitting there waiting for a response. It's, it's totally asynchronous. And your game keeps on running, keeps on playing, and, and whenever this comes in, we're going to put it in that variable, and then we use that variable at some point in the update method of our game. And so one minute it's empty, next minute it's there, and we do something with it. Now one thing to keep in mind, of course, is that XNA games run at 60 frames per second on the Xbox and 30 frames per second on the phone. And a frame in this case is literally one pass through the game loop. So that's one call to update, one call to draw. And it does that 30 times per second. So assuming that a call to a, a web service could potentially be a half a second or it could be five or six seconds, you don't want your game to just freeze and sit there while it waits for something to come back. So your game keeps on going and this fires whenever it, it gets what it's looking for. Now it's, it's important to note that we're not really doing anything with the data returned from the service here. We're not, we're not waiting for it. It's not holding up the game. Things just keep running and, and when the data gets there, we're going to use it in our draw method. But before we put it in the draw method, we need to do a little something in the update method. And so we're going to scroll back up to our update method, which I think I just passed. Here it is. And we're going to put some code in there. I will paste that in as well. So what this does is in order to check for gestures, there's a little bit of code that you have to put in there. Um, XNA will keep an eye out for gestures for you. So if your user performs a gesture, then this while touch panel is gesture available will evaluate to true. Once that evaluates to true, it's going to read the gesture that was just performed from the touch panel and stick it in a gesture sample variable called gesture that we're creating right here on the spot. And then, just some real simple code, if the gesture type is equal to double tap, which that's what we said we were going to support, then that's when we're actually going to call our, our service. And so you notice that it's using something called service one client, right? And so we want to talk a little bit about that as well. Because you're not actually writing any of the code to handle the communications protocol and, and interpret the results of what comes back. You're not dealing with that communications layer at all. You're just using proxies to, to handle all that for you. And so service one client current time dot async, you never wrote a method called current time, dot, uh, current time async. That was generated for you. So if we take a look at the client real fast. Oops, let's go back up one more. There we go. You can see that all of this code gets generated for you. And, and so what it does is when you create that, that reference to the service, it's going to go out and read that service and it's going to build out all these files that take care of creating an asynchronous call as well as creating an event that fires when it gets something back. And, and you, don't, you as the developer don't have to worry about any of that stuff. So it, it's actually super easy to work with. The hardest part is just figuring out what you want to do and, and then making it happen. You don't have to worry about all the guts and the plumbing of it underneath, which, is, which I really like personally. I think that's pretty awesome. And so if you scroll down here, let's find the relevant pieces here. You can see it's doing a lot of threading work and, and setting up delegates. Here's our service client. Handles all your endpoints for you. And you don't want to be writing this code if you don't have to. Trust me. 
So it, it handles what, how to open up the call. Once here's your on begin, on end, and so all you have to worry about is making the call, and then writing whatever code is actually in the service. If you're writing your own service, if you're using someone else's service, then it's even easier. You just need to know what their methods do, and then you're going to get back an event that says, "Hey, I've got data," and you do something with it. So we'll go ahead and close this. Go back to our game. We scroll back down to our update method. So once you double tap right here, then it's going to start the current time async method, and your game is just going to keep right on going. So at this point, you've already seen what happens when we get something back. It gets converted to a string stuck in this variable. So now in the draw method, which is right above it, make a little room in here, this is where we're actually going to add a little bit of code to that. And so we're going to use that sprite batch object that XNA already gives us for free. And we're going to begin our sprite batch. And what the sprite batch does, if you're not familiar with XNA, it basically allows you to make a lot of calls to draw various things on screen, or in, in, the, in this case, using drawstring to write things on screen. And once you've made all your calls, then you call sprite batch dot end, and it's going to bundle up all those calls and send them at once to the video card. And that's going to be a lot more efficient and a lot more performant if your video card is getting everything at once instead of trying to send a message to your video card for every single item on screen, which would really slow down your, your game and, and totally kill your frame rate. So inside of our sprite batch, we've got the draw string method. So sprite batch gives us a few methods. The two you'll use most are draw to draw an image on screen and, and draw a string to put text. So we're going to pass in the sprite font that we created. Uh, a string that says current time plus the value of the current time variable. New vector2. Two. Vector2 two is a data type introduced in XNA and it's basically like a, an XY coordinate. They also have vector3s if you're doing a 3D game. And then color white is the actual color of the text. So this is the color that the text will be displayed. By default, your background is a, is a shade of cornflower blue, which you can see here. And so you're going to have white text on a blue background. So let's go. At this point, we're basically done. You notice that we didn't really do anything in the update method with the data we were getting back. When the, when the data returned, our event handler fired. It stuck it in a variable. And then we just consume it right here in the draw method and, and write it out on screen. Now, typically, the, the services that you create are probably going to be a lot more complex, especially if you're doing, say, a, a global high scoreboard or a, a matchmaker service, there's going to be a lot more going on. But for, for the purposes of this demo, it's pretty straightforward. When you're testing at home, you always want to, unless you have a phone hooked up, you always want to make sure to set your target device to the emulator. And then we'll go ahead and fire this up. Just take a second. And let me grab the emulator, bring it over, and I'm going to shrink that down just a little bit. Loading up. There we go. Me. So at this point, I don't know why it's not letting me move it. Hang on. I must have a dialogue open behind it. Okay, so at this point, it's currently sitting there. It's displaying the current time message because it's going to do that regardless because that's part of our draw method. It's actually writing that on the screen 30 times per second because we haven't done any kind of uh, double tap yet. So we haven't called the service yet. So it's just showing current time and then an empty variable. So if we, hmm, hang on one second. Something is confusing the emulator. Ah, there we go. Let's shrink it down one more time. There we go. Much better. So now I can also rotate it. Excellent. So now, if I double click on it, that's going to be the same as performing a double tap. So we'll do that. And it's going to go out and it's going to make a call. And about a second later, it, we got our response back. And it's October 10th, 2011, 7.02 p.m. and 15 seconds. Now you'll notice that the time does not continue updating because all we did was just display the contents of a specific variable. It would take a lot more code to continually update that variable with actually not a lot more code. It would take a few more lines of code.
to continually update the value of that variable each pass through the update method. So with that, we'll go ahead and close the emulator. Minimize that. And that is all there is to it for consuming a service in your game. You've got your, your event handler, you've got your service reference, you had to write almost no plumbing code whatsoever. Basically all you did up at the top here was you set up your client and you added a little bit of code here to set up the event handler and then you consume the results. And in this case we didn't use the update method, we used the draw method to consume our results. But depending on what's coming back from your service, you, you might want to consume it in the draw in the update method and then do something with it before actually rendering it on screen. But that in a nutshell is how to create and consume a web-based service in your Windows Phone app or game. Thank you.